After leaving Osaka, we headed to Kyoto. Kyoto is an interesting city. It was the capital of Japan from the year 794 up until the capital was moved to Edo, now called Tokyo, in 1868. This means that at the same time it was the capital for over a thousand years, but it didn't get firebombed during World War II, so it still has a lot of history. The thing is, it wasn't designed to be a tourist attraction. Obviously, it's not Disneyland, and so the layout requires some logistics. There are many sort of must-see cultural landmarks in Kyoto. I mean, we didn't see all of them, but to show you what I mean, let's pull up a map of Kyoto. We stayed here in the middle. I'll just quickly go through some of the big highlight places that we went to. Don't worry, I'll talk about them more later in the video. Uh, I just want to show you where they are in the city. There's the Arashiyama Bamboo Grove, where you can walk in a forest of bamboo on the west end of the city. There's the historic region of Gion, which has a lot of shops and restaurants. There's Ryoanji Temple, a Zen Buddhist temple with a famous rock garden. There's Yasaka Shrine, a prominent Shinto shrine with many interred spirits. Kinkakuji, a Buddhist temple with a golden pavilion, is up here. Yozen Kannon is a war memorial uh, which commemorates the dead of World War II and a memorial of the unknown soldier. There's Tenbyuji, another prominent Zen Buddhist temple with a famous pond in its garden. Hushimi Inari Taisha is famous for its nearly 10,000 torii gates. Kiyomi Zadera is a Buddhist temple that's famous for this stage overlooking the area below. Mount Hie to the northeast of Kyoto is famous. There's a nice hiking path there that goes through a mountain temple. Kyoto includes a Shibori museum, which has beautiful hand-dyed, traditionally dyed uh, murals and kimonos. And finally, the Nishiki market has plenty of things to buy and interesting curiosities to look at. So, as you can probably already imagine, there's some logistics required to get around and actually visit all of these different things. You can tell that there's some kind of regions that have more things than others, but just leaving the hotel, visiting all of these points, not even including Mount Hie, which is admittedly a little far away, would take almost three and a half hours. And that's transit alone. That's like walking up, slapping the, the gate of the, one of these things, and then getting back and going out to the next one again. That doesn't count time spent in them, and it doesn't even count time like waiting for a bus or a taxi or something like that. That's just just like traveling in a perfect continuous loop through these things and not Mount Hie. Getting around the city just takes time and that's fine so long as you account for that. We were lucky that we had time, we were here for almost a week and so we were able to just say okay we're gonna go this direction today, we won't go that way until tomorrow and just kind of divide it up into a more leisurely pace. You can do it in less time, people do, but we don't like to rush. So now I'd like to go into more detail about our time here, and I think it'd be easiest to just go day by day. The bullet train from Osaka to Kyoto only takes 20 minutes. So we left our hostel in Osaka at like 11, and by 12 we were in Kyoto. Hell yeah, I'm not crazy. Kill it, Stanley Mark. We actually had some time before we were even allowed into our hotel, so we explored a temple that we found along the way. I honestly don't even know what it is, but it was here and it was big. There was a big fancy gate. There was a big fancy tree. That's all one tree with the, the outer branches just being held up on sticks. They had a big fancy banner. This place is really big. This is actually around the side from that main courtyard. Then they have an even fancier gate. And then we left. It was getting pretty hot by now, so we got some cooler clothes at this mall here. 
And we wrapped the day up with our first Japanese curry at Koko Ichibanya. It's funny, most people when they come to Japan might not get curry. It's not like a touristy thing. It's actually kind of like a Japanese comfort food.、Um, like, you know, their mom might make it for them or something like that.、Um, but it quickly became our favorite.、Uh, we went to Koko Ichibanya many times after this first time.、Uh, Steph's tended to be mushroom and spinach, and I tended to have one of these with a bread and chicken cutlet.、Um, but yeah, it quickly became our favorite Japanese meal. <laughs> But yeah, that was really it for our first day in Kyoto. We took it easy, we got settled in,、uh, because we knew that our next day was going to be a little bit busier. Today was our first big travel day, and we knew that we needed to see Gion and Kiyomi Zadera. And so we decided to just head out walking in that direction and、uh, figure that anything we see along the way is also good. From the hotel, it's、uh, you know, relatively modern, nice shopping street. What is that? I don't know. But as you walk, things get less modern. Steph got distracted by a murder of crows along the way and had to inspect. Turns out they were good crows. It's at the end of the street, it's gotta be something. It turns out that something is Yasaka Shrine. We didn't know that at the time, it was just the first one we came upon. I like that it looks like a mouth. You bow when you enter the mouth. It's be real, it's a shrine, let's be respectful. We visited a lot of temples and shrines today, so there was a lot of hand washing. I'm not gonna show most of it. They were setting up for something, and that banner probably tells me what, but my reading is not good enough to know what we're actually setting up for here. This is the sort of main area where they sell their omamori and things like that. There's a rabbit. We liked that.、Um, yeah, clearly setting up for something. Compared to other Shinto shrines, Yasaka Shrine is interesting because it has these sub shrines that you kind of can walk through. They're little offshoot shrines that contain, you know, the spirit of beauty or the spirit of success in business or the spirit of martial arts. And you can pray to whichever one you're looking for help with, which is interesting. But we had to get going. This is only one of a few places that we were going to visit today. So,、uh, you know, place to be. The reason we came this way is because it's kind of like a neat back area that's just lousy with shrines. Oh, you have my phone. Oh, do you want it? Just to take a picture. Maybe I'm just a dork, but I never got tired of like, looking over the trees and being like, damn, that looked Japanese. At the end of that street is a, a temple this time.、Um, feels completely different from the last one and is also beautiful. I guess we're standing in Old Tani Sobyo. Good to know. I don't know if it's to everyone's taste, but I th just think it looks beautiful. That was something that we liked about Kyoto, especially Higashiyama, this district, which is like, we didn't come to this place in particular. We just stumbled upon it, and it's gorgeous and interesting. At least to me. The temple also had a graveyard, which seemed very interesting. From back here. We didn't feel the need to go walk around in it, but it was nice to see. Moving on. Just your everyday roadside Buddha. So, like I was saying, it's just kind of a neat area to walk around in. Oh, hey, it's a tower again. We found this neat map that was like, here's all the lucky statues in the area and how to pray to them. That was kind of neat. Hey, we found one! Touch them with your right hand or both hands. Touch the pedestal of tall statues. You're not gonna touch him? 
Okay, we don't have to go to this one. Oh, oops, another temple entrance. Well, okay, fine, we'll go in this one. This one is Kodaiji Zen Buddhist Temple, and it has very long, cool stairs. but all a little different. Here's another one of those statues. This one heals sickness. Do you want to touch the ox on your uh, ailment? Mm -hmm. This temple had prayer wheels, which was super cool. But the thing Kodaiji is actually known for is its garden, and you have to pay to get into that. Do you want to take a video? Do not use a selfie stick. Fair enough. It was 600 yen a person, which is vaguely $6. Since I couldn't film in there, here's a picture from their website. Now we're out of the main area so I can film again. Here's a neat bridge and a little lake. Or pond. I don't think we ever did make it to that tower. Aw, oh, jeez. I've been talking about day one for like six minutes already, and I haven't even gotten to the good parts yet. I need to pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Outside of the garden, there's a bamboo grove with a path that walks through it. This is not the famous bamboo grove that Kyoto is known for. That's Arashiyama, which we visit uh, two days from now, maybe tomorrow. Um, but we actually kind of like this one better, I think, just because it is less populated. Uh, the grove is not as big or impressive as Arashiyama, but we were the only ones in here and it was very peaceful. So then we're leaving Kodaiji and we're just going through the parking lot basically and we look over and there's this giant Buddha just poking up over the wall and we're like, well, well what the heck is that? We get up to the front gate, it's about 300 yen or about $3 to enter. We're like, I guess that's okay, but no one else was going in or out, which we thought was a little weird. We were given some incense and then told to put it in the brazier up at the front. So, this is Yozen Kannon, which is a war memorial dedicated to those who died during World War II. And given how busy all the other places were today, this one was kind of eerily deserted. But we made our incense offering and then went for a stroll around the grounds. The area beside and behind the building was somewhere between peaceful and almost like creepily abandoned. <laughs> I'm glad we went, even if it did have kind of a coming upon an, a, a compound in a post-apocalypse kind of vibe to it, at least when we were there. Maybe it was just the wrong time of day and it was kind of overcast, I don't know. Oh, also, you can go through the door there in the back and actually go up into there and they have uh, some shrines to Buddhist deities. We didn't film it, uh, but they also had a shrine to the Unknown Soldier over there. But anyway, on to Gion. Luckily, it wasn't a very long walk from where we just were. Gion is a commercial district that has maintained its kind of historic identity. One of the more recent attractions in Gion is actually this uh, Starbucks which opened here recently and is made to look like the surrounding historic area. People were getting a real kick out of it. So yeah, some of the shops were neat, the area was neat, uh, it was, there was a steady stream of people, but it wasn't like too, too busy or anything. We were kind of pleasantly surprised. But as we kept walking up the street toward Kyomi Zadera, the roads got a little narrower and it got a little bit more busy. We walked past this sign and had to stop. Pickled cucumber on a stick. Wait, what? 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 Okay. Woo. I'll try this. Back out on the street, we could just start to see Kyomi Zadera in the distance and it was starting to get pretty mm -hmm. busy. And just like that, we made it out of Gion and to Kiyomi Zadera.
Kyo Mizudera had a lot of visitors, a lot of tourists, but uh, I understand why. It's beautiful. How lucky are we that we can see a beautiful uh, wisteria trellis like this and think, well, it's nice, but it's not as nice as the one in Miyajima, or, uh, you know, the, as varied as the one in Osaka. It's just a really, you know, it's nice. area that Kiyomizadera is most famous for, this stage that we're on here that overlooks the uh, area below. Um, it actually looks a lot bigger when you're seeing it from the other side where those people in the distance are looking back. This shot I've seen before and it looks like this massive place, but when you're over here it's actually kind of teensy. It's like a little balcony and then behind you is inside the temple, which is interesting. So anyway, here's that shot looking back again. This is kind of the shot of Kyo Mizudera. You've got the stage and then Kyoto in the distance there. So then we went uh, off to the side here. Mm. Also mentioned that we were here in the spring and it was lovely, but this place is really popular in the fall when all of this green becomes autumn colors. Mm. We found another one of these kind of off by itself. Don't know why. We kept walking past that, and uh, there was way less people, and I think we were basically in Jurassic Park, I think? I never got tired of a bamboo thicket. We're walking down this narrow forest path, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, a parking lot. Okay. And then it's up a bunch of steps. We got to this cute little side shrine, which uh, had many fewer people. It also had another nice lookout over the city of Kyoto, um, which again is lovely at this time of year, but I can imagine is electric in the autumn. Back at the lower level of the main temple, we came across the waterfall that Kiyomita Zerera is actually named for. Drinking from that gives you luck in various areas. This is looking up at the stage from that waterfall area, by the way. And from there, we left. But we still have to get back to our hotel, and that means going through Gion again. Along the way, we found some chestnut ice cream. We weren't sure at first if it was vanilla ice cream on a chestnut cone or chestnut flavored ice cream. Turns out it's chestnut flavored ice cream. It was interesting and good. We were craving udon, so we stopped off for some udon. There was one other touristy thing we wanted to see in Gion, which was this uh, black pagoda. There used to be a temple here 1300 years ago, uh, and this pagoda, rebuilt 580 years ago, is the last remaining piece of it. The plaque at the base says this contains a reliquary holding some bones from the Buddha, which is pretty impressive. Man, after all this ice cream and udon, you know what I could really go for? Ice cream. Matcha. So that's matcha green tea ice cream, as well as a matcha mochi, which is kind of a sweet, gummy treat. So we're just sitting here eating matcha mochi ice cream, watching people take their Instagram photos. Cool. Okay, let's get out of here. But even once we're out of Gion, it doesn't mean we're out of temples. We're just like walking down a street here, and then we're walking on the sidewalk, and it's like you could go left or you could go right, and it's like, well, right looks nice. And then as we're walking, it's like, oh, hang on, is this another temple? Do we want to go through it, or do we? No, we're, we're going through it. Okay. It's a temple. This one featured a dog in a dress, because obviously. It also contained this thing, which if you crawled through it, gave you a wish or something. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. There's a squirrel on the tapestry there. 
Oh look, a fabric store. So that was our second day in Kyoto. I think we had curry for the second night in a row. Don't worry, day three is shorter than day two. We started our day by going to the Arashiyama Bamboo Grove, because the earlier you get there, the less crowded it will be. And on the way, it took us past this exhibit of uh, old kimono silks wrapped around a light. Uh, very cool. Today's area was also cool, but had a very different vibe from yesterday's area. Potato sticks. People always take pictures of this kind of serene bamboo grove, and it's funny that this is what's hanging out out front of it. No, it probably takes five minutes. The bamboo grove is very cool. Just to be clear though, the path that goes through the bamboo grove is a path, it goes somewhere. So from the entrance, which I showed you, to here, which is one of the exits, is only about six and a half minutes. It's not a massive place. So we turned around and walked back into it. Serenity. Right. Um, we ended up picking one of the exits that led to a park. The park was nice enough to walk through, but unremarkable to show, uh, but it did have this nice overlook. That's actually a road down there on the other bank of the river. From there, we went back through the bamboo forest to the adjoining Tenbyuji temple, which is basically a nice garden. We walked around and looked at all the names of the plants. It appealed to us, but it's probably pretty boring to watch. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, actually, the hill. It was pretty. I'm glad we went. It also has this beautiful and peaceful Zen pond. They've got like extra wisteria left over, so they're just putting it on the fence. Another breathtaking wisteria display. Can you look over here? <laughs> Obviously, the big pond is the more famous one, but there's just something about this one that appealed to me. And from there, we were on our way to King Kakuji. Okay, but first some light lunch in a cute cafe. And maybe dessert, why not? So then it's back out onto this very narrow, very popular street with all sorts of shopping and stuff. I did really like this trend of Japanese stores that kind of show you a sampling of what they're selling. Uh, the restaurants did this quite famously, but even some of the stores did, so that's really cute. Okay, this is bananas. Thank you. Then a more quiet residential area. Let me just talk about this truck. So these trucks are kind of the default in Japan. And look at how low to the ground they are and how low their truck bed is for convenient loading while still being a pretty big sized truck bed and the driver can still see everything around them. They're not particularly higher than most cars. Just so compact and practical. I really liked them. Anyway, finally we're here at King Kakuji.
Well, you slipped by it and the guy closed in behind you. And it was just me and the students. <laughs> and I was like, fuck it, I backed up and went around. And now they're laughing about it. No photos of large group, no tripod, no luggage. If I'm being honest, King Kukachu is only fine. You kind of walk along the path, and then you turn the corner, and there's King Kakuji, the golden temple that you're here to see. And there's a, a relatively nice lake and a whole bunch of people taking photos of it. And then you keep walking. And it's nice, but lots of things have been nice. The iris? Yeah. Even with your zoom? I think the unfortunate irony as a tourist is that a lot of these places feel like they would be really cool if it was just a nice garden and I was just walking through it and I came upon this gold-clad temple. That would be awesome. But as a result, there's so many people here in like school tour groups and stuff. It just feels like a theme park, which I'm not super interested in. There's a little spring there, but people. I know, me too. She just kind of stood right behind us. Like, anyway, like you can see from the water. <laughs> but like, if we came to Kyoto and didn't visit the Golden Temple, would we have regretted it? Probably. But given that we did go, was it the highlight of our trip? Not even close. At this point in the trip, we've been in Kyoto about three days, in Japan for about four weeks, and we're getting this kind of like garden and temple fatigue. I can't even imagine trying to cram it all into one day. The whole thing would just be a blur of like trying to rush through this and be like, okay, I saw the temple, now quick, on to the next thing, run, 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 run. Anyway, it's not Kinkakuji's fault. Kinkakuji was fine, it was a pretty lake with a building in it. It was lovely. But if I came back to Kyoto, would I go again? No, it's just a place to kind of check off the list, unfortunately. It was nice not having to worry about losing Steph in the crowd. Okay, on to our last temple and garden of the day, Yoanji. Most people don't film the, like, paying for a ticket part because that's not the sexy tourist part, but, like, these places are not free to get into. This one's, like, 600 yen a person, which is about $6. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm sure the money goes to a good place, but it's, you know, it adds up a little bit throughout the day. Oh, it's got a cute little, uh... Aww. Yeah, I think those are big geese. I think you're right. Versus swans. So, a lot of this is a walk around a pond, which is kind of what we just came from at Kenkakuji, and to a lesser extent, earlier in the day at Tenryuji. Oh, there's a little wisteria here. But, I like this pond, it's a nicer walk around a pond. Mm -hmm. This teensy island had a little shrine on it, which is cute. A lot of these places put a lot of work into supporting the trees, which I love. I love this. The, the wood structure. And then the, uh, like the ceiling, essentially, to keep it supported. That having been said, uh, Ryoanji is actually most known for uh, its Zen garden and not its garden garden. The temple itself also has these gorgeous murals. Hang on, let me just turn down the music for a sec. It was very peaceful and kind of a nice place to be on a rainy day. So for my taste, at least on this particular day, I actually really like Yo and G. Mm. I love the branches swinging low out over the water. If I was to return to Kyoto, I might actually go back to Ryoanji, especially if I didn't think that there was going to be a bunch of other people there. Alright, one other place we wanted to go today, which was the Shibori Dying Museum. 
By the time we got there, there wasn't a lot of time before they closed, but they were amazing and they let us take the dye workshop anyway. So you fold it in a very particular way and then clamp it. And then you press it between these end pieces. Obviously, it wouldn't have been acrylic traditionally. And then you bring that over to the dye pots. And then you dunk it in the dye and the parts that aren't compressed soak up the dye. And then while our rinky-dink crafts oh, okay. were drying, we got to go up to the museum where literal masterpieces were on display that skilled craftspeople did over the course of years in teams. It was amazing. Like, this is just one small piece of the overall larger whole, but you can see as you zoom in the way that it was tied and knotted to get this detail. And the guy wouldn't let Steph get out of there without wearing one of these incredible handmade kimonos. She felt embarrassed inspecting the things, let alone wearing them, but he insisted. <laughs> And then it was time for our big reveal. I love tea, and so when I knew we were going to Japan, one of the places I wanted to visit was a Japanese tea farm. And I managed to find one that's not too far from Kyoto that does tours called Obubu Tea Farm. To the train! The train only took us to the farming town of Wazuka, but while there is a bus that goes to the tea farm, it, the schedule didn't work out so we ended up taking a taxi through town. We booked the tour in advance, we made it just in time. The tour starts off with all of us loading into the van and getting a drive up the mountain to where the tea grows. All the way up our guide is telling us about the area and about Japanese tea in English. Uh, those are some tea bushes there by the way. <laughs> So these are just rows and rows and rows of tea bushes all the way down this uh, little valley here. And basically everywhere they can put one. So now we're up at the top and we're hanging out with the tea bushes. Those light green leaves are the ones that get harvested and turned into tea, and the dark green ones stay on the vine to keep the plant alive. I won't go, I will become your paparazzi. <laughs> Our guide also helped us take photos. most expensive kind of sandy green tea is made here in Wazuka. In the last 20 years, matcha has become very popular all over the world, mm. as you know. And now, Wazuka produces around a quarter of all of Japan's matcha. So, Wazuka is the number one matcha producing, producing town in the world. <laughs> he had a few bits like that that he read out to just to make sure that he didn't forget anything, but mostly he spoke off the cuff. Yes, thank you. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, baby leaf. Mm -hmm. The kind of dark green color leaf is mother leaf. Mm -hmm. Mother leaf is super tough and hard. Mm -hmm. The uh, from last year, of course, and from last year, mm -hmm. uh, stay here. Mm -hmm. That's all past winter season, mm -hmm. but uh, tough and strong. So uh, frost or snow coming mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, Baby leaf is super tender mm. and rich moisture. Mm. Yeah, so and uh, so no, this uh, baby leaf uh, grow up time is end of March to beginning of May. Mm. Uh, quite mm. a lower temperature. Mm. Some day uh, come frost. Mm. If uh, ma, uh, no, frost uh, day is ma, sun, sun, sunny day. Mm. day. Frost day is sunny day. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, midnight early morning, and uh, the uh, temperature are getting degrees. Mm -hmm. The frost coming. Mm. The go frozen. Eh? Mm. Right. Only and uh, baby leaf frozen. Mm. They become uh, soon and uh, sunrise. Mm. 
、うん、であのクイックリーメールと、うんうん、するとこうライカーズなんて言うんでしょうねあの、まあ、あのセルウォールがブロークン、うん、でこの、うん、ファイナリードライインザティーフィールドでビカンブラウンカラーゴーンと。Uh. And then it was back into the van,、uh, down to a small field next to their main building for a description of harvest. He told us about the traditional method, which just uses the thumb and the forefinger to gently press the tea, making sure not to use the nails to pierce it, but to just kind of squeeze it with the soft of your fingers and then plucking upwards. So I'm basically a Japanese tea farmer now. Mm. Whereas the more modern way is an arc shaped trimmer, which is why the bushes are that shape. They'll go down and back the row,、uh, filling up this big bag with it, and then、mm. they'll take the bag over to the on site factory to have it processed. He also told us about how the spring first harvest is the best quality、mm. leaf.、Uh, that's what they'll use to make like a high quality sencha or matcha.、Um, and then they'll harvest again after that, like two or three weeks later, to get kind of the second quality mm. leaf. Mm. And they'll use that for lower quality teas or hoji cha or something.、Mm. I asked if we could eat some of the leaves, and he said it was okay. Oh, it's nice. Mmm. Mmm. Tastes like a pear. Not to me at all.、Oh. It tastes like dandelion. All right, I guess I'm just wrong. Cute. And now we're off to tour the factory where they do the processing of the leaves. This is their on site tea processing factory.、Uh, they gave us a great tour of. I've cut most of it out, you know, because it's just long, but I'll show you what I can. First, this is one of those modern harvesters I was talking about. So those pipes there blow the leaves back as the trimmers cut, and it's arc shaped so it goes over the whole row. So you just walk down the row with a bag attached there, and it cuts the leaves and blows them. Back into the thing, and then you do the other side. Super cool and way faster than picking it by hand. So, this first step steams the leaves until they're like 300% moisture content, and then this blower blows them up and over to the next machine, which is this cage up at the top here that cools the leaves and collects them until enough of all collected in one place. Then they get dumped down to this bottom machine where these paddles spin around and kind of roll the leaves to squeeze the moisture out. And then a second stage, which is basically the same machine, but it squeezes harder to get even more moisture out. Next, the tea leaves are put up there, and that big heavy weight drops down, and then this whole thing turns, and it kind of crushes the leaves to make them available and turns them into these little balls. But this farm is making sencha, so we don't want ball shapes, we want needle shapes. So this one breaks the balls back and apart into individual leaves again. And then on this machine, they go under those rocking back and forth things,、uh, which rolls them against the bottom, turning them into that needle shape that we're looking for. And then the last step is a kiln that just flips them back and forth over time as they dry,、uh, which allows them to dry evenly. And then that's、uh, basically ready to get packaged up. All in all, it was a great tour. I had to cut a bunch out, but I would highly recommend it. But we weren't even done yet. They had a whole lunch prepared for us, which was great. This was a whole platter of pickled various things that Steph really enjoyed. While we ate, there was a presentation about the various ways to brew these teas. We were taught how to make matcha, which was cool. Mine was okay, and if anything, Steph's was maybe whisked too much.、Uh, she was going faster than the camera could capture. <laughs> All in all, I had a really great time, and I strongly encourage anyone who has an interest in tea to check it out. It was exactly what I wanted. Everyone was super helpful, and they had all had answers. It was awesome. And when all was said and done, we had about five minutes to catch the bus, or else we'd have to wait for like another half hour for it to come. So we had to run out of there. But they all kind of came out to wave goodbye to us, which was super cute.、Uh, just a great time. Made it. <laughs> This is probably gonna sound stupid, but it was just neat being surrounded by like tea fields and rice paddies, you know, kind of agriculture. This is where the tea comes from. I really liked it. And if I may have a minor rant, I was able to get a train from Kyoto to Wazuka, this town, and then from the train station to the farm. And that bus came every half an hour. I can't get a half hour bus to my house in the city here. It's just crazy that we could just rely on public transit like this. And Wazuka is a farm town, not a tourist town. Anyway, that was day four in Kyoto.
it's already a zoo. When we woke up this morning, it was our plan to start the day at the Fushimianari Shrine in the south of Kyoto. We'd walk through the thousands of Tori gates that it was famous for, and then we'd catch the train going south to Nara, which is a different city that's famous for its giant temple and its bowing deer. But something was bothering us about Kyoto more and more, and it came to a head at the Inari Shrine. Let me show you one version of Kyoto. That doesn't really exist. I had to cut pretty heavily to pretend that this place wasn't packed to the gills with other people. And honestly, the people aren't really the problem. It's their photos. And I mean, I get it. The place is kind of magical, right? People want to take a picture of it to remember it. And like, I'm a tourist, I'm walking around with a camera strapped to my chest because I want to record these things. No single person is like the bad guy that's ruining this for everyone necessarily. But everyone wants a photo of just the gates, which means they go slow and they wait for the people ahead of them to walk out of shot and then they take the photo and then they move on and the people behind them do the same thing because everyone wants the same photo and that's what causes this slowdown. And because no one person is the bad guy, you don't want to be the jerk by ruining that person's photo by like walking into frame or something like that, right? So you wait for them to go through and then that person's photo is maybe okay and then you run into the next person. They say to get to the Inari Shrine early and apparently they mean like 7 a.m. because we were not early enough, I guess. Now obviously the constant starting and stopping bothered me, but the thing that bothered me more, I think, was that people didn't even seem like they were looking at the place. They were just stalking around with their phone in their hand, looking for the next backdrop for their Instagram photo. Something that really says, wow, I'm in Kyoto. I bet if they confiscated phones at the entrance, 80% of these people wouldn't even come here. The walk and then turn and look back was a very popular choice. But it wasn't just the Inari Shrine. This happened in Gion just a few days before. This is a fan store. It happened at Kiyomi Zadera. It was frequent at the Bamboo Grove. Honestly, even with the photography, it's fine. Like, I think these people are all lined up to all have their picture taken on that fence. At King Kakaji. I know, I understand. Basically, Kyoto is full of narrow walkways that people want to stop and take pictures on, and by the time we got to the top of the Inari Shrine, it had accumulated mm. to the point where we were very frustrated. Mm. So we didn't actually go to the peak. Uh, we got most of the way up, we realized we weren't enjoying it at all, we saw the Instagram people going up, and we decided to take a back road back down the mountain. Basically, as soon as we chose this back way, the people evaporated, and we were able to enjoy the walk a lot more. Hmm? Instagram is the worst. Oh my god. This way doesn't have the fancy gates, but for us it was worth it. Oh, that's a nice bee. He's a big bee. He's hovering real good. They want to get the photo of being in the gate that everyone else has, so they can say, like, yes, I also have that photo of being in the gate.
and and then they leave, <laughs> you know? Now, our plan at this point was to go to Nara, but Nara is touristy as hell, and we were not in the mood at this point. So we found a delicious little diner near a residential train station, and we regrouped to come up with a new plan. While we were in Tokyo, we went to this outdoor store, and we told the guy working there we were going to Kyoto later, and he said, oh, there's this great hiking spot in Kyoto. And we thought that was Hiezon at the time. I'm now pretty sure he was talking about a different place, but either way, we went to Mount Hiei, and we really enjoyed it. It started with another cable car, like the one in Hakone, As a reminder, cable cars don't have any motor on them themselves. There's a big uh, station at the top with ropes that tug this thing up the mountain and at the same time lower another one. This one's much more complicated than the one in Hakone though um, and as a result it makes turns and stuff and they've got these sideways angled wheels to move the rope around the corners. It also has a cross. There's only one track at the bottom and one track at the top and then there's this one section where the two split and one goes one way and one goes to the other. I was originally pretty impressed about this but uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, here you can see on the track one of those wheels that's directing the rope around that corner instead of around the corner this way. Super cool. Geez, we're getting pretty high up. At the top here is a little uh, waiting area. You can just hike from here, or there's also a ropeway which takes you even further up, which is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go up and then hike our way down. This is really pretty. They also had a thing where you could like buy some clay discs and throw them through that hoop. I'm not really sure why, but okay. Unlike a cable car, a ropeway does not get dragged up the side of the mountain. It instead floats over it, which is good because that's there's no tracks there. The ropeway was closed when we were in Hakone, but we did do a ropeway in Miyajima back when we were in Hiroshima. And now we're at the top looking to hike our way back down. It's always funny to take a cable car and then a ropeway to get to the top and you find a parking lot because it turns out it's possible to just drive up here. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad we went this way, but it is funny. Uh, lookouts were beautiful though. There's one on this side and another one on the other side. That's pretty cool looking. The map says that city down there is Otsu. A little bit higher to the true summit at the top was this weird concrete compound. I don't know what the hell this thing was. It's okay, we didn't come here just to look at the top. <sighs> the trip down was a relatively well-maintained little trail. It's funny, back in the Takayama video, we were on a hike, um, and there was an animal that we encountered, a uh, Japanese sero. Um, so I found here, uh, we were talking about that animal. Zero seems like a fairly rare. Mm. So, I don't know. Oh, did you want to talk to the footage and see if you can see it? Uh, yeah, you can catch like a glimpse of it uh, for like 10 seconds. I'd still put a red circle around and be like, you'll never guess what this was. Mm hmm. It's funny for me because here's that clip that we're talking about. As we were coming up the hill here, we saw some animal uh, that was just walking casually behind this group. And the, ca the camera doesn't really pick it up very well, but we didn't really know what it was. It didn't really have it's just funny to hear me talking about the Takayama video while we're in Kyoto, given that I'm now working on the Kyoto video like a year later. Uh, it just really makes the time feel long. <laughs> anyway, back in Kyoto, it became clear that we were walking towards something. This is the edge of Enyakuji Temple, but coming upon it in the woods, it felt like something out of like Star Wars or something. It was, uh, it was really cool. <laughs> of course, you can also just drive up to the temple, but that's boring. Do you think anyone mistook me for a Japanese man who belongs here? Anyway, it was peaceful and beautiful as many of these temples are, but you know, I'm just gonna kind of skip through it a little. 
It was actually quite large. It had a few big buildings up here on the top. And then a fountain, and you go down those stairs in the background there. Lots of stairs, actually. The pole on this section is wiggly, which I think is so that whether you're going up or down, you can grab it kind of more ergonomically, rather than just like a flat pole. Or maybe it's just wiggly, I don't know. And then there's another huge building when you get to the bottom of that. Look at this cool beetle we found! Okay, one more building and then we gotta get out of here. This one is tall and old, and also has a nice little rock statue garden behind it. Turtle! So now we're leaving this place, because we have to get to the cable car before it shuts down for the night, which is like six, I think? As we're walking away, there's like another temple tucked majestically back in the woods there, but it's like, we gotta go. I don't have time. It is a very pretty trail, though. Okay, we had a little bit of time to spare. This is why I came to Japan. The way the mountains just disappear into the distance and just become bands of color remind me of like old ink paintings. That's probably not a coincidence. As we walked, we walked under the ropeway, which I guess makes sense that we would have to eventually. Back at the top of the cable car, they have a little waiting room, which is nice. A lot of these kind of places in Japan had stamps, so we had little stamp books uh, that we, we collected all the stamps we could find in. <laughs> also, these anime girls represent the cable car and the ropeway, respectively, which made me a little uncomfortable. So yeah, that was our time up on Mount Hie, or Hiezan. I have no idea. But luckily, I still have time to talk about how cool the cable car is. So there's two lines, and one of them attaches to this cable car, and the other one goes all the way down the track, down the mountain, to the one that's at the bottom. And when the cables start to move, they're linked. They move at the same speed up and down. So the point where the up car and the down car cross isn't this delicate ballet of timing. It's actually inevitable. That's just the point where the ropes are the same length. That's basically the midpoint of the trip. That's where they will always cross because they have to cross there. Super cool. It's also probably pretty efficient because the car two cars weigh the same. If I just kind of like let the one fall, it'll mostly pull the other one up. So the only actual power that needs to go into it would be the difference in the weight of the passengers and then friction on the rails and wheels. What an awesome system. Here's another shot of those angled wheels allowing the cable to bank around the corner and still pull us up. Ugh, so good. We also saw a cute little deer on the way down and another in the distance. Cute little butt. That night we just had uh, sushi at a restaurant attached to the Kyoto train station. It was okay. The Otoro tuna was pretty good though. Day five in the bag, one left. Our last full day in Kyoto was pretty relaxing. Steph had a textile tour booked for the afternoon, which we didn't record, so this morning we were just basically going to go to the Nishiki market to check it out. When we were in Tokyo, we did well to show up to the Tsukiji fish market uh, early and beat the crowds, so we figured the Nishiki market here in Kyoto would be kind of like that. We were wrong. Everything was closed. Apparently they open at like 10-ish? I mean, not literally everything was closed. Some things were open, but not most things. That was kind of a bummer. But that's on us for not checking. Even still, though, I feel like this wasn't really the market for us. I mean, this was our basically our last full day in Kyoto here. So this is maybe a lovely place to buy fresh fish or a bunch of chestnuts, but that's not really where we were at in our trip, you know? We did find a really nice cafe, though, where we got some, like, uh, bagels and cream cheese and uh, yogurt smoothie. Super Japanese fare. <laughs> but it had a nice little patio thing in the back. It was lovely. 
Speaking of Japanese stuff, one thing we hadn't tried yet was an animal cafe, and we walked past this uh, little pig cafe while we were in the area, and we were like, okay, we'll try one.、Um, they are kind of ethically questionable, and having now visited one, I feel like they're kind of ethically questionable. <laughs> A room with a bunch of, well, a bunch of baby pigs in it, which is cute. And then at least in this one, you sit down with a little blanket on your lap, and they come over and they snug you, which is, again, adorable. But at the same time, they also all have this kind of suckling, chewing motion, and they're clearly just using you for your warmth. And it kind of feels like, should these be away from their mother? They did all have personalities, though. Like there was Snuggle Pig and Bitey Pig and Sleepy Pig. That was cute. And obviously there aren't any adult pigs, so those all have to go somewhere after this. So all in all, it was cute, but I don't think I'd go back to one. You know. Did you want to drink any of your hot chocolate? Actually, everybody was so busy with pig. I know there's a lot of pig business going on. <laughs> We were at the back of the room, and so when our time was up, we got evicted last, and all the other pigs who were disturbed before、uh, stampeded over to hang out with us, which was cute. Right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> And、it's not like the baby pigs were snatched away from some heavenly experience. I mean, they might have been taken from a factory farm, and this has got to be better than that, right? Conflicted, but it was cute. Anyway, back out on the street,、uh, there's a store called Daiso in Japan, which is kind of like almost like a dollar store.、Um, But we found one in Kyoto here that was trying to go upmarket and compete with、uh, Muji, which is a, a different Japanese brand, kind of like Japanese IKEA. So we thought that was kind of funny. Good try, Daiso. Hmm. And then we also made our way to a store called Walnut Kyoto.、Uh, it's a knitting store. We've already been to Walnut Tokyo, but there's also one in Kyoto, so we went there too. So yeah, that afternoon, Steph went on her fabric tour, which she really liked.、Uh, I stayed in the hotel and worked on the Hakone video, which feels like a lifetime ago. And、um, I think we went out for curry again that night. That was our last full day in Kyoto. Oh right, room tour. At this point in the trip, we had been in Kyoto for just about a week now, and our next stop was Tokyo. So we had taken all of our bags apart and kind of put everything everywhere so that we could figure out which things go into which bags. But either way, this is the main room of the room. That's where I worked on the Hakone video, and the bathroom. This hotel was actually pretty nice.、Um, we knew that we were going to be here for a week when we booked it, so we booked something that was perhaps a, a little bit nicer than it could have been. It was more like a business hotel rather than like a hostel or something, which is what we had just come from in Osaka. So it was nice. As for Kyoto itself, Kyoto was great. We did get a little tired with the Instagram photos, but all in all, we had a great time. I'm glad we came. I think it's possible to do the city in less than a week, but I wouldn't want to do it in one day. Next up, our triumphant return to Tokyo. See you there. <laughs>